Hey everyone, my name is Nathan, welcome to Hail. It's time for another wrapped episode where I talk about all the movies that I watched in the past month as well as some life updates. I'm especially excited for this month's episode because if you weren't aware, last month was Alfred Hitchcock month on my channel and so I watched a ton of Alfred Hitchcock movies, both first time watches and rewatches. I also read some books related to Alfred Hitchcock and I snuck in a few movies that I just wanted to see just because I was interested in them. So I'm gonna start with the Alfred Hitchcock content that I watched and then I will segue into the rest of the movies I watched for the month. First movie, I checked out was The Paradine Case. This was a first time watch. It was great seeing Gregory Peck as well as Charles Lawton. Really the two reasons that I wanted to see the movie in the first place. I think my biggest problem with it is that I was expecting a bigger twist than what I got. The ending is pretty predictable. There was no shock value and I think that I'm used to seeing a Charles Lawton courtroom movie with a really good twist. <clears throat> witness for the prosecution. And so this movie just didn't have that. However, I still enjoyed different aspects of it. I just was a little disappointed by the ending. Next up, I checked out I Confess with Montgomery Clift. And going into this movie, I didn't know that Montgomery Clift was going to be in it. And so I was very pleasantly surprised when I saw his name on the title when the movie was starting. I think that the plot just screams Alfred Hitchcock. It's about a Catholic priest who is in a confession and the person confesses to him that he has committed murder. However, the priest cannot tell anyone about it because his commitment to being a, a priest prevents him from sharing anyone's confessions. And so it just throws you into that classic Alfred Hitchcock conflict where you don't know what the character is going to do. Honestly, I'm all for a 90 minute movie. I prefer shorter movies, especially nowadays where my schedule is so busy, but this movie ended and it left me wanting more. I didn't want it to end. And so I wish that there could have been a little bit more resolve to the story. Other than that though, Montgomery Clift was amazing in it. It's kind of funny because he did such a good job that him and Alfred Hitchcock butt heads a lot on set. Honestly, you can't tell it, the movie is very well done. I was so excited for the opportunity to rewatch Rear Window, but this time in the movie theaters. My local theater chain was showing the movie and so I had to watch it. I went with a friend and my little sister. And I mean, come on, it's Rear Window on the big screen. It was an amazing experience experience. I'm always just so in love with the final 20 minutes of the movie and seeing that specifically on the big screen was just the best part of the whole experience. I then watched a movie that's not directed by Alfred Hitchcock, but it is Hitchcock related and that is The Girl. Now this is an HBO original movie that came out almost 10 years ago and it's about the filming of The Birds. So it's a biopic about Tippi Hedren's story and her experience with filming The Birds and how Alfred Hitchcock came on to her and wasn't fair to her or took control of her. Looking back on the movie, I've taken some time and really kind of reflected on what the movie is portraying as well as me trying to be fair to what the movie is trying to portray. And I still just don't like the movie. I feel like it's an incredibly unfair movie to make in the first place. It's all very one-sided. Uh, it's saying all Tippi Hedren's side, but you don't get any idea of where Alfred Hitchcock was coming from. And it's also unfair because Alfred Hitchcock was long dead by the time this movie was made. And so it's not like he could have had a say in the matter. On top of that, I was reading online that a lot of people who were involved with Alfred Hitchcock who saw the movie were completely floored because it was just very inaccurate. I don't want to disregard anything that Tippi Hedren said and because I do believe that there definitely was some controlling on Alfred Hitchcock's side. However, the way this movie paints him is a villainous person that is like some sort of predator and I didn't like that. I thought that it was very unfair to his name. Again, I'm not saying he's perfect. I know that the man had faults. I just don't like this movie and the way it was portrayed. In addition to that, I just don't like made-for-TV movies, and this one is screaming made-for-TV in the way that it's filmed, and the acting is not that great. Uh, Toby Jones is really good at his Alfred Hitchcock at first, but then you just kind of get tired of it. I just wanted to turn the movie off. In fact, it took me several attempts to finish this movie, so there's that. Coming off of The Girl, there are a few scenes that have to do with the filmmaking of Marnie, and I had never seen that movie, so I chose to watch Marnie. It's an Alfred Hitchcock movie, again with Tippi Hedren, and I think that she gives an even better performance in this movie than she does in the birds. Sean Connery is also in the movie. When the movie first ended, I felt like it was a good movie, but the more and more I think about it, I have to admit that it is a great movie. There are some things that I don't like about it that don't give it that perfect status or even that nearly perfect status. However, the things that I do like about it, they stuck in my mind well after viewing it. There's one scene in particular where Sean Connery is almost like acting like Marnie's psychiatrist, and that scene was very tense. I just liked the whole setup of the scene, but there were some very cheesy scenes as well, which made the movie lose a few points. I then 
rewatched Dial M for Murder for the first time in a few years, and this is an Alfred Hitchcock movie that I know I will always love. It's one of the first Alfred Hitchcock movies I ever saw, actually. In fact, I think it was the second one I ever saw. I remember even being younger seeing it. I thought, this is a very good movie. This has my attention, and I want to know what happens. It's a movie that's very heavily filled with dialogue, and you have to pay attention to every word that's said. Otherwise, you will get lost, and you won't understand what's happening. It's based on a stage play, and so as far as the writing goes, I don't know how much was changed for the movie adaptation, but the fact that Alfred Hitchcock was still able to film it in, for the most part, one setting and still have it be so engaging, that's where Dial M for Murder succeeds for me. On August 11th, I discovered that Pat Hitchcock, the only child of the Hitchcocks, had passed away. And so in honor of her life and just kind of remembering her and in honor of the Hitchcock name in general, I decided to check out Stage Fright. This was the last movie that I hadn't seen from Pat Hitchcock's collaborations with her father. I really enjoyed it. She doesn't have a big role in the movie, and so if nothing else, I just appreciated seeing what I could see of her. The movie itself was also enjoyable, had plenty of suspenseful moments. In fact, I would say that from the moment that Alfred Hitchcock makes his cameo to the end of the movie, there's plenty of moments that had my heart racing, and I was just really engaged with the story and the directions that the movie was going in. I just thought it was a solid, smaller Hitchcock film. Mr. and Mrs. Smith is a very underrated Alfred Hitchcock film, mostly because it's not suspenseful at all. In fact, it's a screwball comedy. The most surprising thing of the whole movie is seeing Alfred Hitchcock make a cameo because when you're watching it, it feels more like a Frank Capra movie or like a Ernst Lubitsch film. It just does not feel like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. However, I'm a fan of screwball comedies. This movie really worked for me. I laughed several times. It has such a goofy score. It repeats the same like whistling tune several times in the movie and every time that it does it, it just makes me laugh because of how silly it is. Robert Montgomery's character made me laugh the most, specifically a scene where he's in a restaurant pretending to talk to someone to make a girl jealous. That scene had me laughing out loud very hard. Carol Lombard was also awesome to see. I haven't seen too many movies from her, so I liked seeing her. At the end of the day, though, I actually really dug Mr. and Mrs. Smith as a screwball comedy. As an Alfred Hitchcock movie, it's not very good, just because it doesn't feel like one. But if you're looking at it as a comedy, I think you'll actually enjoy this one. Young and Innocent is another smaller Hitchcock movie that still has a lot of Hitchcock elements in it. The movie has a very similar plot to what we're used to with Alfred Hitchcock, where a man is wrongly accused of something that he didn't do, specifically in this case, a murder. I feel like that's usually what we see with Hitchcock. There's a particular scene in the movie where Alfred Hitchcock is wanting to show you a specific reveal and I don't want to talk about it because it is a spoiler however the way the camera zooms in on this reveal it reminded me exactly of Notorious where it starts off far away but it gets closer and closer and the closer that you get the more you realize oh this is really important what I'm supposed to see and when you see it what he was trying to show to you you understand and you can't help but just really appreciate it. Saboteur is a movie that I also really enjoyed it's about a bunch of people who basically like to create mayhem and cause distress just because they want the power and that is like such a good motive for a villain. It reminds me a lot of Joker where like some men just want to watch the world burn. It's like the same tier as the Joker's reasoning in The Dark Knight. So for that, I really appreciated the villains in Saboteur. However, I'm not a big fan of Robert Cummings as an actor. I've seen him both in this and Dial M for Murder now and he's honestly the weakest parts of both movies for me. I just... I don't love him. I feel like he's a very stiff actor and when he's supposed to be showing a lot of emotion or fear or whatever it is his character has to be doing, he doesn't succeed at what I want to see from a character in his position. So that's what I didn't like about it. However, it has a really exciting scene at the end on the Statue of Liberty of all places that I also loved to see. I then rewatched Notorious and that was such a treat. I hadn't seen it in a few years, popped in my Criterion copy and just got lost in it. Notorious is such a great movie and I think that every time I watch it, I will notice something new, or at least I will like it a little bit more each time. For me, it went from a 9 out of 10 movie to a 10 out of 10 perfect movie. And my last Hitchcock movie I watched in August was Under Capricorn. It's kind of unfortunate that I ended the month with this movie because I wasn't that big of a fan of it. However, I'll start with the pros. It has Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton, so that's awesome because I like both of those actors. And then on top of that, something that not a lot of people know about Under Capricorn is it's very similar to Rope in the sense of there are plenty of long take scenes. 
scenes. And so I really like what Alfred Hitchcock did with the camera in this movie. It's very clear that the scene lasts very long time before cutting and I appreciate that when directors are able to do that. I always love long take shots. The biggest problem with Under Capricorn is that it's just a really slow movie. For a movie directed by the master of suspense, there isn't any suspense until maybe the last few minutes of the movie. And even then, it's not very suspenseful. It's like one scene is like exciting, but we've seen so much better from Alfred Hitchcock. Okay, now I'm going to talk about other movies that I watched in August. First off, let's go with East of Eden starring James Dean. This movie was a good movie up until the point where it's the father's birthday party. And then from that point on, it became a great movie because James Dean gives a great performance in this film, especially at the father's birthday party. It actually reminded me a lot of Rebel Without a Cause in the sense of this character that he's playing is just very conflicted. He feels like he's a loner. He doesn't feel loved by his parents. It's just one of those movies that started out as good, but by the time the credits rolled, I was like, yeah, that was a great movie. Mrs. Miniver is a movie I watched because it's a Best Picture winner, and I'm a big sucker for World War II movies. In fact, I would say it's one of my favorite sub-genres of film, and so this one had a lot of things that I loved about it. It is a longer movie, and I watched it in more than one sitting. I will happily admit that. However, there were a lot of scenes that were just very emotional and well done, especially the ending. The last few minutes really got to me. And on top of that, I also want to say that anytime an actor or actress from It's a Wonderful Life pops up in a movie, the movie instantly takes a piece of my heart because I just love It's a Wonderful Life so much. In this case, Henry Travers, who plays Clarence the Angel in Wonderful Life, he has a role in this movie. And so I loved seeing him in the movie. But overall, Mrs. Miniver is actually a really good movie and I can see why it won Best Picture. Another James Dean movie I checked out was Giant. And I watched the movie wanting to see James Dean. And unfortunately, he does play as big of a role as Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson. Those are the main characters of the movie. It made the movie very boring to me because since they're the main characters, obviously you're mostly focused on their lives. Anytime it showed James Dean's character though, I was completely invested and I was wanting to see more of him. And so anything I liked about this movie really was just because of James Dean. Everything else, it just wasn't really my kind of movie. I'm not a huge fan of Westerns and it was very long too. I also didn't really like Rock Hudson's character at all. He was kind of a jerk. I rewatched Kiki's Delivery Service. My little sister had never seen it. She was really wanting to watch it. So we checked it out. And this is just a great anime. But the idea of the movie is that when you're a certain age as a witch, you go off on your own and live on your own for a year. And that's what this movie is. It starts off with her leaving her family and she goes to a new place, lives there for a year. And it's the adventures and different things that she goes through that makes this movie really good. You know me and how I love checking out at least one James Stewart movie every month. The first one I saw this month was Magic. Town, which is a very underrated movie. I checked it out from my library. For how underrated it is, I'm surprised how much I liked it because I feel like it should have more attention. It was filmed right around the time of It's a Wonderful Life, and so you've got James Stewart in his prime age, and it almost feels at times like It's a Wonderful Life. His character feels like George Bailey, and so I think that's a lot of the reason I like this movie, but it also made me laugh several times, and it's just a super feel-good movie too. And so if you're looking for a movie to put a smile on your face, and you like James Stewart, check out Magic Town. A silent movie that has been grabbing my attention for a long time is Son Sunrise, A Song of Two Lovers. Nope. It's called Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans. My bad. So Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans was a silent movie that felt completely ahead of its time. I was just amazed at how this movie was created. It just had different techniques that I had never seen used in a silent movie. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And so for that, the movie gets a lot of points. I also like the story too. The whole thing's on YouTube, so you can watch it there. This last month, I read a book all about Janet Lee and her experience with the filming of Psycho. And so reading that book about her career in Hollywood made me want to see more movies with her. And so I watched the movie, The Naked Spur, which stars James Stewart and Janet Lee. But the crazy thing is I didn't watch it for James Stewart as much as I did for Janet Lee this time around. This is a great Western movie that follows a bunch of dishonest people who are all trying to turn in those same wanted man. And it's basically the adventures they go on as they're trying to turn this wanted man into the police or to the sheriff, whatever you call it in Western movies. This was seven years before Psycho was made and Janet Lee gives an amazing performance. James Stewart especially stands out because, I mean, I love James Stewart. There are a few scenes at the end of the movie in particular that he just absolutely amazing. This is why I love James Stewart. Another James Stewart movie I checked out was Come Live With Me, which gosh, that is such an awful title. I do not like the movie title at all. However, I loved the movie. I don't know how to explain this, but to me, young James Stewart to like Wonderful Life, 
life era James Stewart, that's like the prime of his career. Don't get me wrong, I still love him in movies like Rear Window and Vertigo, but I just really like him when he was younger on in his career. So, Come Live With Me, he's very young, and I thought he just did great in his performance. He plays kind of an awkward guy who's single, and he agrees to marry this woman because she needs to claim citizenship in the United States. However, through this marriage that they're doing just for her sake, he starts falling in love with her and trying to get her to fall in love with him. And honestly, it's just an adorable movie, and the ending had me with the cheesiest smile on my face, and I love when a movie can do that. Pom Poco was a freaking weird movie I checked out. After watching Kiki's Delivery Service, my little sister and I were wanting to see a little bit more of anime, Studio Ghibli, and uh, Ghibli, whatever it is. Pom Poco was not what I was expecting at all. All I knew is that it was a movie about a bunch of raccoons. Within the first five minutes, anything I expected of the movie was just completely gone down the drain because it's really weird and one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen, but I still enjoyed it. However, put some pants on. Please have the raccoons put some pants on. Before moving off to Utah for grad school, I watched West Side Story with my mom. This was a rewatch. I hadn't seen it in several years though, so it felt like a brand new watch. I didn't even remember the ending to give you an idea of how long it had been since I last saw it. It got a lot better on a rewatch. The biggest concern I could see people having with this movie is, well, first off, if you don't like musicals, you won't like the movie. Movie. But also on top of that, all the fighting scenes are choreographed in a way where it's a hybrid fight and dance sequence. And so some people may not like that. It definitely feels a little cheesy at times, but it was never cheesy enough for me to dislike what I was seeing. I actually thought it was super cool. The music is just amazing. The score is great. I really like West Side Story and it made me so much more excited for the movie coming out later this year. I then checked out The Suicide Squad and it was pretty good. You know, I enjoyed it. It was funny at times. I like King Shark the most. Is that his name? The Shark Guy. He was the best one. Another new release I watched was Free Guy, which was better than I thought it would be and pretty enjoyable, but at the same time, still pretty dumb. However, that one cameo, you know what I'm talking about? That's definitely the best part of the movie. Then I checked out The Nun's Story, which was a longer movie. It took me a few settings to watch it. However, Audrey Hepburn gives a great performance. The movie itself was very fascinating seeing how this initial Initiation process goes with becoming a nun, like the covenants that you go into and the commitment that you go into. I don't know how accurate the movie is to really becoming a nun, but what I saw, I feel like I learned a lot and I was pretty interested in it. I then checked out Coda, which when I finished it, I thought was a good movie, but the songs in this movie made me change it to a great movie because I have downloaded two of the songs from this film to my playlist on Spotify and I've been listening to them because they're just really well done covers. And the movie is very heartwarming too. There's some crass humor that I would get rid of just because I'm not a big fan of crude jokes and whatnot. But other than that, I really liked the message and the feel good theme of it. I then checked out Profile, which was a lot more disturbing than I was expecting it to be. Definitely some scenes that I just like, I'm not even gonna lie, I just pressed fast forward because I didn't wanna see what was about to happen. However, there's a lot of suspenseful parts of the movie and the twist, if it is a twist, I would consider it a twist, was something that stuck with me several days after viewing the movie for the first time. And so for that, I, applaud profile. And I also appreciate that it's another movie kind of like searching where it all takes place on a monitor and it's done in a very good way. And finally, I ended the month off with an Orson Welles directed movie, The Lady from Shanghai. It's a very weird movie. And the more and more I think about it, the sillier it gets in my head. The camera choices are very peculiar. Like you zoom in on different characters and it just feels very uncomfortable at times. But I kind of like that about it too. And Orson Welles' accent is very goofy. But I also like that too. It, it feels like our Hitchcock and Orson Welles teamed up and made a movie and I am totally okay with that. As far as my favorite first time watch, uh, because it's Alfred Hitchcock month, I'm gonna choose an Alfred Hitchcock movie and that would be I Confess. As far as the least favorite watch, it was The Girl. And if I were to choose a favorite first time watch outside of the Hitchcock movies I watched, I would choose Come Live With Me. Okay, as far as books read goes, I made a whole video about all the Alfred Hitchcock books I read. And so just watch that video if you wanna see my thoughts on those books. The only other book that I read is To Kill a Mockingbird. I listened to it in my car and I love To Kill a Mockingbird. It was the second time I've read read the story, read, listen, whatever. I read it in high school, but hadn't read it since then. And I don't know if I can choose a favorite book of all time. I think it's just too hard because there's so many different books. But if I were to make a top 10 books list, this would definitely go on it. This next segment is definitely a new one for the channel. Video games I finished. Um, Spider-Man PS4 game. I am not a gamer by any means. However, 
if you put Spider-Man in a video game, I guarantee you I will most likely play it. And so I finished this game and the reason I'm finishing it so late is because I just got a PlayStation a few months ago for the first time in my life. I love this game so much to a point where it almost made me cry by the end of it. It got me teary eyed and I just think that it was basically more a movie than a game because I was so invested with these characters lives. For what I was wanting, it delivered and then some. And I'm currently playing Miles Morales and I enjoy it. I do like Spider-Man more though so far. All right, as far as physical media pickups go, I got a few movies, some that I wasn't able to bring to Utah with me. And so here's a picture of the one that I didn't bring with me. <laughs> Sorry, Warhorse. Anyways, I got Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone on VHS. I specifically wanted this copy because this is the one that we had when I was a kid and I'm all for having nostalgia on the shelf. So I got that. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade because it was 99 cents. And also there's something about having a Steven Spielberg movie on VHS that just hits different. So I had to get it. And then Zia had the deluxe edition of Gone with the Wind. This is a VHS deluxe edition. And I think my family even used to own this copy. I have no idea what happened to it over the years. We probably just got rid of it at some point, but I love the look of this and I just really want it on display. And so I bought this. The way I was able to watch West Side Story is I actually picked up the 50th anniversary edition from Zia. All these movies actually are from Zia. So shout out to Zia. This must be new for Zia, but they had criterions that were used that were much cheaper. They always have used criterions, but they're still usually like $25 or something where I'm like, it's not even worth it. However, I saw one that was only like $16.99 and I was like, that's a great deal. It was the kid. It's one of those movies that I've always meant to buy in my collection, but I never buy it because I'm just like, oh, I'll get it next time. I'll get it next time. I finally got it because it was a great deal and I'm glad I have it in the collection now. And then two movies I got off of eBay it is East of Eden Digibook and Rebel Without a Cause Digibook. And finally at Best Buy, I got the Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone 20th Anniversary Edition. It has like that 20 years of movie magic thing where it comes with some special features, but I mostly just love the cover. I really hope that Best Buy does the whole entire series with this kind of cover art because I'm not a Steelbook collector anymore, but this is something I, I would love to have each movie on Steelbook for. And then life updates. And so the month of August was pretty crazy because the whole first half of the month I was stressing about moving to Utah and starting grad school up. And then the whole second half of the month was me moving to Utah, starting up grad school, and now we're here. The drive was okay. It's a long drive, but you know, you have to do it. Utah itself has been great to me so far, living in a great house, have some great friends, really liking grad school so far and I just am excited for this chapter of my life. With that though, I should say because I'm starting grad school, I don't know how often videos will be posted. I still have plenty of videos in mind for what I want to release, but all I'm saying is that I don't know how consistent the schedule will be. At least it won't be as consistent as it has been in the past. I went on a hike and saw a snake as well as a polar bear. So that was really cool. Also a few days later, I was driving around town and I found the world's first KFC. Apparently I live like 15 minutes away from it. So I guess that's pretty cool. A sneak peek for the channel in the month of September, you can expect some Twilight Zone videos as well as a video devoted to James Dean. I'm really excited for what's coming in September. Anyways, guys, that does it for this video. I appreciate you for watching. Let me know what you watch. Have a great day.